Here we go. I, I you know, I should have brought a baseball all right, so we could have a ceremonial first pitch for this edition of the WTOP Auto. I always come ill prepared. Dave Johnson along with Rob Woodford, uh, Christian, Dave Preston, George Wallace, welcome you to, I guess we should call it our opening day edition of the WTOP Huddle. Ready to get it going. The, the Nationals uh, start against the uh, New York Mets, and that's just a reminder of what a tough division the Nationals are in the uh, National League East. And we'll begin the conversation with a guy who you see the mood lighting that Dave Preston has. It's so we can hide the suntan he got in Florida so he doesn't make the rest of us jealous and he can still put in his expense reports. He actually spent part of a spring training in Florida with the Nationals. So here we go. This team has come north, ready to play ball. Are they ready to play ball? Well, they better be. I mean, if there's one thing I think that we've learned from the Nationals recently is that they traditionally start slow in April. Even their 19-31 and 31 start, they – they, they stumbled out of the gate in that game, that opening day against the New York Mets that felt like everything that went wrong with them in 2018, the same thing happened in 2019. Uh, last season, they didn't start fast. They didn't finish fast either, their first losing record in nine years. I think that this team is uh, focused as they should be getting back to uh, getting back to D.C. Uh, there were a lot of questions that were asked uh, over the last month. Some of them were answered. Some of them were answered in not the way that we wanted them to be answered. I think a lot of people uh, hope that Carter Keyboom would be the starting third baseman, that he would be able to at least hit and be productive. I'm not saying hit 300 with 30 home runs, but at least be a competent bat in that six or seven spot in the lineup. He was not, and now he's going to be in the minors. He's actually going to be in Fredericksburg at the minor league camp because AAA play doesn't begin for another month. So they're going with Band-Aids at second and third base now. Uh, that is, I think, the big question entering camp that was answered in the way that they did not want it to be answered. I think other questions, Steven Strasburg, how would he be after the wrist surgery? He looks good. Uh, how would uh, John Lester be after having his thyroid gland removed? He has looked sharp. Uh, I think there, there are plenty of positives, but there are, as always, there are always going to be questions when you enter a 162-game regular season. All right, and to put it in baseball parlance, I should—I guess we should go around the horn. So I guess now I'm playing second base. It was, you know, when I was a kid, Dave Johnson, the baseball player, played second base, and I always thought I wanted to be a second baseman until I realized you actually had to move to catch the ball, and that didn't—that yeah, didn't, that didn't work that. out so well. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> I always, always tend to oversimplify things. In football, I say you go as far as your offensive line. In baseball, to oversimplify it, I think this Nationals team can contend and be competitive if the starting pitching staff is healthy. If Max Scherzer uh, still has the zip on the fastball, he doesn't start to look like a 37 year old. At some point, even the best of players lose something. You can't beat father time or usually you can't beat father time. And obviously Steven Strasburg has to come back, back healthy. So for me, it, it starts with the pitching staff. I think they're the intangible of having Ryan Zimmerman back is also a factor. I understand he's now just a role player, but just having him back and, and that calming influence. And he, by the way, he had a, a good spring as well down in Florida. So I think that's an important factor. When you got a guy like Juan Soto that could hit the options that manager Davey Martinez has in that batting order, I think that's encouraging, but I think it all gets back. And, and again, I'm not breaking any news here in baseball with, with, the, with the pitching staff. And I think also the acquisition of Brad Hand was something we have not talked about that really will strengthen the bullpen. So there's the view from first base. We'll go over to our second base. We'll go over to shortstop and the guy who really can cover some ground, Rob Woodford. Well, I'm more of an outfielder, at least on the WTOP softball team, but uh, I, I, I will actually uh, piggyback off what you were saying there. Uh, I, I actually believe that I, I, the pitching staff makes me a little uncomfortable right now because you are asking Max Scherzer to be an ace at a at a period in his career where you know maybe he should start to slide down in the order a little bit um uh you know steven strasburg asking him to stay healthy that has always been a challenge for him uh, you tell and, max he's got to slide down in the order a little bit well i'm him. not saying he's got to do it today but i mean at <laughs> age 37 i mean we're we're starting to kind of get to the point where you know it, it's not a foregone conclusion that he's going to be the cy young uh, contender that he is on a year in year out basis. We're getting to that point, even though we may not be here today. 
By the way, but, before you go on, I'll, I'll nominate Chris to, to deliver that message because he wants to tell Alex, <laughs> Alex Ovechkin to sit down. Mr. Woodford, that's right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But but I just I'm 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 just uneasy about that uh, that pitching staff. So I'm actually going to go a little bit further, and this is going to come off a little hot takey, but I think that this team is only going to go as far as Juan Soto takes him. I think if he is mm. in the MVP conversation, I think the Nationals are in the playoff conversation because if you look at this division we've discussed it here before top to bottom this is a team where any one of the five could be in the playoffs and you know in order to distinguish yourself you've got to have one of those bats that is just torrid on a pretty consistent basis so the you have to have some good luck with the injuries you know in terms of injuries especially when it comes to that pitching staff but if Juan Soto is an MVP uh, 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 front runner or, or even in that conversation, I think that's what gets the Nationals over the hump in a really competitive division. All right, Chris, Chion, we go to third base, the hot corner. Who do you want to sit down? <laughs> so I don't want to sit down Josh Harrison, who has absolutely had a fire spring, talking about Carter Keboom, who went six of 40 at one point in Grapefruit League play. Um, Josh Harrison – was hitting 419 at one point, the same as Josh Bell. So those are two corners there, third and first, that are pivotal and are hitting an early season. We talk about some of these early season struggles. I mean, if these guys are already hot, we can hit the ground running. I think this team is poised to make another World Series run. Steven Strasburg is the X Factor. Dave, you totally nailed that one. We know what Scherzer is going to give up home runs. He's going to get a lot of strikeouts. He's going to probably win more than he loses. Patrick Corbin also an X factor because he took a step back last year. They pay him a lot of money. He showed decent signs in the spring that he is ready to be a pitcher that comes out every fifth day and wins again more than he loses. Um, but I think the hitting is there. Rob, you mentioned Juan Soto. I mean, he just got the cover of, of one of these magazines. He is almost the face of baseball. Can. Yep. Face yes, of baseball yeah. now. And, uh, Victor Robles is coming into his prime. I feel very great about this team catching without, uh, you know, Kurt Suzuki is Alex Avila going to be able to command the same and, and work with these pitchers. Probably he's a veteran presence there. Luis Garcia. I know he was just optioned down, but he's somebody that is a young player as well. And, and Carter Keboom, if he can work out those issues that he's having in the minor leagues, but I think this team is deep. I think that they are the best team in the division. I mean, I go over Atlanta, I, I don't know. I, Atlanta has Ronald Acuna. If Juan Soto is, is a face, you know, so is Acuna. Those two guys, both of them. Um, but I just think top to bottom, Washington is better than Atlanta. Um, the Mets are going to be good, but Philadelphia, I don't think their pitching staff's good enough. So I think this is the best team in the division. Uh, so George, just, <laughs> just, just, just to give uh, uh, Chi a little pushback there, I, I think on an annual basis, the Nationals look on paper top to bottom better than most of the teams in their division. They just haven't finished that way. So that's, that's always what gives me pause is that there's something there that looks good that doesn't play out that way once the season starts. So that's always the thing that gives me pause with them. And again, that's credit and, to Mike Rizzo. I, he, he, I right. think he does a wonderful job. You, you, you yeah. think about the Josh Bell is another one. You know, right. we could talk about a lot of acquisitions, Kyle Schwarber, whatever, that he yeah. does that the Phil holds. George? Yeah, I was going to bring up uh, Bell as well. I mean, you know, you, you, you want – and I think the way they, they handled Zim this spring was perfect. The way they played him a couple days a week, kind of how he was – how he's going to be throughout the season. And, look, if Josh Bell's raking it, you don't want to see Zim in the game. You know, you're going to, when you, when you play American league ballparks, you can DH fine, play a couple days a week, but I think he's going to be key. Uh, look, this team is not a ton of people are picking them. They, they aren't the sexy pick this year, which I think is going to be good for them. This is a veteran team. They know what it takes to get done. You're not going to go 19 and 31 every year and come back from it. You can't start 19 and 31 this year. The schedule here, here's the deal. This team get to 85, 90 wins. It, they can do it. The first part of this schedule with the Mets, Braves, Cardinals is brutal in April. You get out of that around 500 or so, I think you're in really good shape because of the way that this, this the way your schedule is, is front loaded. Uh, Max, keep in mind on Scherzer. He, he said at the end of last year in September, remember they, only, they didn't play him any games. So he was kind of felt like he was only in, in the summer, basically ramping up for the season. So I think that's going to be huge. Strasburg gets back, Corbin, and you don't need John Lester to be the old John Lester. You need to fit in just right. 
in this in this rotation. And Juan Soto, look, the team, he should have been in the MVP conversation last year. He missed those two weeks for that false test in the beginning of the year. Wasn't happy about it. And then he came out, was on fire. You know he's going to have a chip on his shoulder and ready to prove that he is the MVP of this league. So you expect to see big things from him. Uh, you know, the key is going to be, it's you know, I know you say it every year and, and every manager says it. I think the key is going to be the, the start. I mean, you have to start. You, you can't start really slow. You have to you have to hit the ground running. And I think this team will, will be anxious to do that. I think they learned from, you know, from last year. I mean, not learn, but, you know, they, they – they didn't have their true defense of a world series championship. So I still think they want to prove that this year, that last year was a fluke in that shortened season. And they are still at the tops of the league. You know, it's interesting, but that point, yeah. I almost feel like it's, they're in the same situation. The capitals are, are, are in sort of, uh, because I think the way we're seeing the capitals play right now is uh, they're mad that about that shortened season last year, they didn't really show yeah. the best at what they're all about. And so the nationals, have that chance. What, what do we think about, uh, I mean, we talked about the starters, the, 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 the yeah. bullpen, you know, Dave Presto, I'll go to you. The, uh, uh, because it, it, in this game, you don't pitch nine innings unless you're no. Max Scherzer going for a, 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 a shutout or a no-hitter. Well, no, <laughs> uh, Rob's, got him, Rob's got him going an inning in two-thirds. Every, every yeah. Oh, he's, he's an opener. Yes, let's see how yeah. that works. <laughs> I, think, I, I think the bullpen is going to be one of the keys to how well this team performs this year. And even when they won the World Series, their bullpen had the second-highest ERA in the majors, I think, uh, right behind the Orioles, and they had a disastrous season. So I think the bullpen that you see on opening day is very is not often the bullpen that you see in August and September. I still think there might be a move or two to be made. Will Harris beginning the season on the uh, injured list. I think Brad Hand is a good pickup. Daniel Hudson should be back to his 2019 form, but that's the thing. You don't exactly know. I think you look at how well players perform in the field and on the mound. It's almost as though you have 25 different mutual funds and there's no guarantee that previous performance will, you know, per, will improve this year or will come back to earth. I think three X factors. We talked a little bit about the bullpen. We've also mentioned Patrick Corbin. We know that over the long haul, Steven Strasburg and Max Scherzer have been productive pitchers. Corbin had a decent first year for the Nats last year was kind of a disaster i think another x factor victor robles took a step back last season he led off uh, from the beginning of spring training if he can be that x factor atop the order that can allow trey turner to be back maybe a spot or two in the lineup and have guys on base in front of him where he can put that on base percentage and slugging to work for him that can put uh, juan soto you know at the plate with guys on the base paths in front of him if robles can uh, translate what he has done in spring training to the regular season, that's going to be huge for this team. Another factor for the Nats, I think they start off with 13 of their first 19 games at home. Last season, they went under 500 at home for the first time since I think 2009. And having 5,000 fans, even 10% of capacity to start, will be huge for this team that couldn't play in front of their fans last season. You mentioned Trey Trent. I think it, the Nats fans should be excited that you have players in Turner and Soto, two exciting players that you want want to lock up to long-term deals and, and the Nats really hope that they can. Before we move on, other thoughts on the Nationals as we're getting ready to play ball and next week I'll bring the baseball. <laughs> I have the uh, World Series sweatshirt over here in the corner if you want me to break that out. <laughs> I, I think, think it's just real quick, Ryan Zimmerman. I don't know that we harped on this enough. I mean, he's really looked good in this yeah, spring. Yeah. I think uh, it's these guys who took off last year and uh, older guys who wanted to rest up their bodies. It's kind of paying dividends, it looks like, because Zimmerman looks fresh now. It's going to be a nice little platoon at first base. And I know often they say baseball is a team sport played by individuals, but I think we saw the reason why this team won the World Series and went from 19 to 31. Team chemistry, uh, uh, you know, ball club chemistry, uh, clubhouse chemistry is an important factor. You know, we we know the baby shark was such a part of, of the yeah. run in, in 2018. I don't think Ryan Zimmerman is going to be doing the baby shark. But as I said, I hope open, <laughs> open this. Don't go there. But, yeah, but I, I think it is important to have him back. And face of the franchise, I think, is more than just a, a title or a designation we, we give to him. Uh, and especially in terms of leadership with some of these younger players that we just mentioned, 
uh, he will be an important part of the Nationals' progress. I mean, just think about just think about what Ray Lewis was in Baltimore because it's kind of the same situation. I mean, how often do you get a player who's the same who's you know played from day one of your franchise? So it's kind of like that Ray Lewis situation. Ray Lewis wasn't the player that he used to be when they won their last Super Bowl back in 2012, but. You know, he was out there on the field. They rallied around him. He was kind of the, you know, sort of the leader of that defense, even if he wasn't playing at the same level that he used to. And I think Ryan Zimmerman could be the same thing here for the Nationals. He could be that guy who's a part-time player, who's kind of the, you know, the conscience of that uh, of that clubhouse. And, uh, and and hopefully it has a similar ending. All right. And, and, and it's not like it's, it's, it's not like he's, it's not a, um, it's not like a token victory tour right. for him. You know, like he's, right. We know his history, though. He comes it's April, May. Sometimes is slow with his injuries. You know, coming from Florida. Uh, but you know, the way they used him, I think the spring is perfect. I think they had the, they had, they sat down, they had the conversation. He wants to come back and contribute. Can he still get it done? I mean, you see, when he's healthy, he can still get it done. Yeah. At least we saw in the, for this past month and a half. Obviously, it's a long way to go, and it's a long season. But you know, forget the fact that he's coming back and and helping. I mean, I think he can really help this team. Oh, yeah. You know, this year. I mean, I, I do. We'll see how it plays out, obviously. But I, I don't think it's a victory lap thing for Zim. Right. And um, at this phase of his career, less is more. So you're not right. asking him to be the guy at first base. You're not right. asking him to be the bat in the lineup. He's just a bat in the lineup. And, the, the, you know, the more uh, effective he is in that smaller role, the better it is for the team. Yeah, no, I didn't and mean not to justify – not, not not to justify the shrimp scampi I expensed in West Palm Beach, but there is an article on WTOP.com highlighting the Ryan in winter uh, that uh, we put on uh, over the course of the weekend. It's on the WTOP app if listeners want to check it out. Just for that headline alone, you should have been able to get two shrimp scampies. That was good. The Ryan <laughs> in winter. Ryan said that was good. All right. Uh, parting shots this week on the WTOP <laughs> huddle. George Wallace, before you have to go do a sports cast. Uh, Anything. I listen. I, I, I'm I'm still focused on the uh, this this tournament. I think you got a chance. Obviously, we're recording this the final day of the Elite Eight. Uh, the Gonzaga. This all could be moved by the end of the day. But I think the way what the NCAA has been able to do these last two weeks, with the exception of the VCU situation, I think they deserve a lot of credit for. I was in Indy, and I, I know I mentioned it last week, but the way that they handled the protocols and the way that they had the entire thing set up in the entire city and the venues and this and that. I, I think they deserve a lot of credit for what they've been able to do and pull off this tournament. And I think it's evident that this is still one of the greatest sporting events, uh, uh, of, you know, of the season uh, of the year, obviously, and, and how much we missed it a year ago. We've seen some exciting hoops and hopefully we'll see, you know, again in the, uh, in the final four. But I think, I think the way the NCAA, even and the women's tournament too, the way they pulled off both of them, I think they deserve some credit. Yeah, and, there, and there's two tournaments, and that the one thing, and we all agree that they deserve a knock on that it was borderline to me bananas. You've got two tournaments involving your men and women, where one doesn't talk to the other and say, "Well, you know, we're doing this kind of facility for the men's tournament, <laughs> so we should do the." the it, it's not yeah. that hard to do yeah. like for like and same for same, and and somehow they didn't. And there's, you know, as Brenda Freeze said it well about that that controversy. You know, obviously the right hand wasn't talking to the left hand. And, and, and in this age where we have phones and texts and emails, there's no excuse how anyone could think, well, you know, we're just going to put this weight room for the women and this for the men and nobody will notice. Everything gets noticed and, and should. Who's next? Hey, Preston. Well, yeah, I'm talking about uh, the NCAA tournament, a little super awesome bracket cup action here. I was just glad that I was able to put styrofoam to good use this year as opposed to throwing it into a landfill. Uh, we talked a little bit about the NCAA, a, a leadership vacuum atop uh, the NCAA, just completely you know, dropping the ball, as we mentioned, with you know, different situations for the men and the women's tournaments. Great run by the Maryland women. Uh, a very young team. Uh, uh, Brenda Fries had to replace starters that they lost due to graduation, starters that they lost to transfer. Uh, basically, a new starting five this year, even though Ashley Owusu saw plenty of time last winter. What an incredible player she's becoming. She's just a sophomore. Diamond Miller's a fantastic, a dynamic player who made the leap as well. This is going to be a very good team next season. It's going to be interesting to see who might stay because they're allowing those players that extra year of eligibility. But even with a very young team and a couple of transfers here and there, they were able to be the number one scoring offense in the entire country. And I look forward to what what's next, as always is the case with this Maryland Terrapin uh, women's program. Chris. So something that struck me this week, um, 
Mac Jones now is the betting favorite to be picked number three by the San Francisco 49ers. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's crazy his meteoric rise. We were talking about him being a reach at Washington at number 19. And now maybe Trey Lance becomes available, somebody that you could draft here and allow to watch the veterans play Fitzpatrick and Heineke and kind of learn that first year. But Mac Jones with San Francisco, I does, I, you know, everybody keeps saying, oh, in Kyle Shanahan's system, anybody's going to work in Kyle Shanahan's system. He's a good quarterback's coach. He made Kirk Cousins look outstanding during that brief time and RG3 the same. And who's the rookie uh, of the year? Yeah. <laughs> RG3 John Beck, not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I just think that, uh, that Mac Jones, a lot of people, a lot of the criticisms, well, he has the most outstanding receivers and whatnot, but I kind of went back and watched some tape and he just makes the right throws. He makes the throws that aren't going to be intercepted and he has quick release too. And I I'm not going to overlook the fact that he played some opponents like Vanderbilt and whatnot uh, during that one year or the fact that Tua Tagovailoa started over him. But I think Mac Jones is going to be a better NFL quarterback than Tua who has looked in that first year with the Dolphins that he struggles with throws over 10 yards. So Miami in a little bit of a predicament, they'll probably look to address to get some pass catchers with Devontae Smith out of Alabama. But I, basically, long story short, absolutely this, this draft is going to be one of the more exciting ones we've had in a while with three quarterbacks going in the first three picks. Long story short, that'll be the title of my autobiography one day, <laughs> Rob. <laughs> I'm just going to piggyback off Chris on this, man, because I was fascinated when I saw that trade come down. In fact, I was at lunch with a friend when that happened, and I completely stopped mid-sentence to see the scroll on ESPN talking <laughs> about the 49ers uh, trading up to the third overall pick. I, I don't know how you justify – trading up that far, trading that many assets, and then taking Mac Jones. You could probably have him at 12. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's a system quarterback. He's a good quarterback. I'm not taking anything away from him as a player. But I, I don't know how you trade up that far and don't go for the home run, which I think would be Justin Fields at that yeah. spot. I think I Justin Fields is the pick there. So I don't think you go that big in terms of how much you traded to get up to number three and 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 take a safe pick because when you take the safe pick you end up with Mitchell Trubisky in Chicago and we all know how that turned out so I think Justin Fields is going to be a 49er and watch out I think that's going to be a really potent pairing if you put him in that Kyle Shanahan offense all right and I'll, I'll close my thought this week and next week by the way the Capitals will still be winning so we'll, still, we'll talk about the Capitals <laughs> no doubt uh next week and I, uh, again what a story they are but I, I'm not sure where this wizard season is going to end up going. There's, they're going to, they're going to continue to fight. I think we've learned that how fragile this team is in terms of it, it, it's not deep. So you lose a Thomas Bryant, you lose a Dava Spurton, and even an Ish Smith. And then, then suddenly it becomes real difficult and they don't match up against certain teams, plain and simple uh, teams that are physical. Although the acquisition of Daniel Gafford, who is, you know, uh, mm. so, sadly sprained his ankle in his second game, you know, certainly is going to help this, this team. But I do hope we appreciate Russell Westbrook because um, he is a true professional and, and he's averaging a triple double. And when you have to complete a sentence with he joins Magic Johnson and Oscar Robertson is the only two other players to have. And he's the only player to have a, a triple double with 35 points, but mm -hmm. but a 30, 20, 10 triple double. When you complete the sentence with Magic Johnson and Oscar Robertson, you're in pretty good company. But beyond that, he's not about the numbers for himself. You know, those kind of numbers happened in the game when Bradley Beal was not playing and they needed him to account for 88 points in 39 minutes, which is what uh, he did. And he does remind me of a Paul Pierce's approach to the game. All he wants to do is win and all he wants to do is make his teammates better. And it occurred to me last night uh, or uh, with the Wizards game on Monday that a lot of his turnovers, were, and there's been too many this year, he's trying to get other people involved. It's not turnovers where I'm trying to make the spectacular play. And like any player of that ilk, there will be plays where he tried to do too much, but in general, it's because he's trying to get other people involved. And, and uh, he's a player that I do hope we appreciate for however long we have him in Washington, because he's going to be a future hall of famer. So I there will, we go. I, I will say real quick that Gafford injury bummed me out uh, for one because I had that exact same thing happen to me in high school and I ended mm -hmm. up in a cast for six right. weeks. And I know medical uh, uh, advancements are a lot better than they were in the mid 90s, but 
uh, that, that bums me out because him off the bench and, and, and actually Dave might be the only one who gets this reference. I, we haven't had that kind of explosive, yep. uh, you know, uh, lob ability in the, in the game since Darvin since Ham was coming off well, the bench in, uh, yeah. in garbage time back in and, the late nineties. And, <laughs> and, and don't laugh because he's probably going to end up winning more championship rings than LeBron, JaVale McGee. Somebody can play that yeah. high above uh, the rim. And he's turned out to be, by the way, a, a, a fine uh, professional, but uh, as Scott Brooks well said it with Daniel Gafford, you don't even have to make a good pass, just throw it up there and he'll find a yeah. way to, to, to bring yeah. it down. So, you know, he's yeah. a, he's a going to be a difference maker when he gets back on the floor and, and it's an ankle sprain as we have our discussion right now. Uh, although he did say last night in the post-game press conference, he hopes he didn't get a wood fork. No, anyway, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> With that, with that, we're out of time. I think I just lost my job. They, they, they name a lot of things after me. Injuries aren't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> For Dave Preston, Christian, George Wallace is doing a sports cast somewhere, we hope. Somebody's got to be on the air. Rob Woodfork, I'm Dave Johnson. Thanks for watching the WTOP Huddle. Break. Break. All right, guys.